Hi, this is Paul. This morning when I walked on the levee, there was a whole bunch of corner stuff to catch up on. Some really great stuff on Luke's channel and Mark Parker's channel, but I saw Alex O'Connor on Justin Brierly. I'm sorry, I always forget her name. The Seen and Unseen podcast up there at Lambert, Lambert Library or something. Beautiful views. And I, I've really grown to really like Alex O'Connor. And I... I haven't watched a lot on his channel. I've watched a lot of his little stuff, but I've watched his conversations with kind of the normal people that are that I've been watching for a while. And and he introduced me, and I learned something new about him, which is this emotivism. And if somebody comes on and convinces your audience to be an atheist, then next week you can bring on someone to convince them to be <laughs> religious. You know, you can mm -hmm. you can try to balance things out in a way that you can't do if you're just yeah, just sure. speaking your mind. So. These days, I guess I'm I'm doing less of what you were you were talking about, which mm. is which is trying to say, here's me, here's my view, and here's why you should agree with what I'm saying. Rather, here's just an interesting thought to consider yeah, yeah. in the mouth of someone who knows what they're talking about. You know. Yeah, and I suppose that helps as well because I don't know, most people get the luxury of having the of of working out what they think in private, and then if they want. Uh, I think I missed this the section. I actually remembered it. I didn't just look it up. It's Bell Tyndall. It, you know, th things bubble up in my mind. I had a little period on Twitter today when I was trying to find something. So I thought, I, I'll go to Twitter and see who can help me. And um, eventually these things sort of bubble up. But yeah, we're getting to the right spot. They think in private and then if they want to go public with it. But are you, so are you giving yourself more of that luxury now? To yeah, kind of... and I, I like to think that I always have in that I'm not going to immediately share, yeah. you know, thoughts that are starting to, to occur. I, unless I share them. Uh, I'm making that. That, that had nothing to do with him. It had to do with me, with my immediate sharing. Making that plain. So, oh, I've been thinking about this. Like, mm. you can watch the trajectory of my videos talking about ethical emotivism. And a few years ago, you would have heard me say, you know, I, I think that I, I'm I'm quite attracted to ethical emotivism, but I'm not sure. And then a year later, it's mm. like I'm basically an ethical emotivist. And, and nowadays, I'm like, yeah, I'm an ethical emotivist, right? And you can, yeah, I've been talking. Now, I'm just a pastor. Ethical emotivism. I, I didn't know what that was, so of course I had to. You know, we, we have these these things now that, that help us find things, and and the uh, the the AI is is getting pretty good, and the 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 Bing AI. What is it? Copilot. Uh, you know, because I'm lazy and on a Windows computer, it's just hey, ask this thing, and so I ask this thing, and uh, I don't know. It's got footnotes. That's that's not too bad. Emotivism is a meta-ethical theory suggesting that moral judgments are not statements of fact, but rather expressions of emotional attitudes. This view often refers to as the hurrah-boo theory, posits that when we make moral statements, we are essentially expressing our feelings about particular actions rather than stating objective truths. Luke, for one, I heard him go after the objective-subjective thing. You keep going after it, Luke. I'm with you, man. Um... For example, stealing is wrong is not a statement about fact, but rather expressing disapproval for stealing. And motivism was profoundly expounded by H.J. Ayer in his 1936 book Language, Truth, and Logic, and further developed by Charles Stevenson. Does this align with what you're thinking? This is a rather personal question there for a, for a machine to ask me. Um, I, I would have to say, as with many things, when I don't catch the name, I've heard them described, and Tim Keller used to talk about this quite often, in his sermons in the in the mid 90s that that moral claims are basically talking about uh feelings now the, the funny thing that he did was he talked about ethical emotivism and it's kind of like talking about dry water because the whole point of emotivism is that there's no there there behind the morality but it's you're simply expressing feelings now i completely agree with him that for the most part, this is a human behavior that we express our feelings about something with respect to all sorts of things based on our intuitions. And we can get into right brain, left brain, all of this kind of thing. But when you say sort of ethical emotivism, you're still trying to frame it in the existence of good, bad, right, and wrong. And again, this goes back to Lewis who dealt with the the versions of these kinds of things in his day, and he basically said, sort of like 
question with respect to free will that keeps getting trotted out. You know, people all over the place say there is no free will, but it's a performative contradiction. That's that's something that uh, John Verveke is talking about quite a bit lately. It's a performative contradiction with respect to free will, as what Peterson points out. And I think with this emotivism, there's just it's just laden with performative contradictions, right and left. And you won't by by no means having again, I am not a philosopher, I am not an academic, I am not a scholar, I'm a pastor, and I spend my time watching people. And what this describes is that this is what people do is essentially correct, but it doesn't really make a lot of statement about is there anything out there that morality or our sense of morality is intending to relate to. Now, I'm always on the lookout for articles and someone, this got posted, I don't know where, this is Freya India, had this piece and uh, I'll make my confessions now, yesterday at the classes meeting, uh, which was a very long meeting, I had a little device with me that had articles that I tend to put in a certain category and um, Classes is a fine time to catch up on some of my reading. I can listen and I can listen and read at the same time very easily at classes. In fact, I can do that a lot easier than I can with a lot of uh, this little quarter live streams. She was talking about the um, the problem with the other problem with everyone setting their own personal boundaries is that we are all getting very confused, heartbreakingly confused. Look at the relationship forms. Look at all the contradictions. Date someone new. Um, now, and not only do you learn their likes and dislikes, but their version of right and wrong. Now, again, this sort of reduces right and wrong down to their likes and dislikes. Everyone's boundaries are entitled to respect, and all are equally deserving of respect. Now, one might ask, uh, where does the norm of reciprocity come from? Because, quite frankly, the norm of reciprocity, that's, that's, not, as, that's not as built into anything as any of the other moral norms that we might be looking for but now i might be getting emotivism wrong and so if i'm getting it wrong please correct me in the comment section cross theirs and you're tos toxic everything is up for debate which is why i think we're ending up with these young women compl online complaining about having to explain basic decency to their boyfriends because it seems that the emotivism of boys and the emotivism of girls not the same thing. Louise Perry, in fact, has an entire career based on the fact that the one Grim Grizz clip that he plays very often of me laughing back when my beard was quite a bit longer was listening to Louise Perry describe to Tammy Peterson how she watched these uh, feminists lecture to young men uh, about Marxist um, feminist theory and how it didn't seem to damper their sense of basic decency. And we should laugh at that because pastors and church leaders and moral scourges of, of many people downstream of Christianity in the West uh, have been trying that with all sorts of devices for many years. Uh, growing hair on your palms, making you blind. Um, all sorts of ways uh, the young male sexual instincts have attempted to be curbed. Well, yep, that's what's happening when everyone makes up their own morality. And so basically what Freya India notes here is that, in fact, if everyone makes up their own morality, there is no morality. Now, morality is a tremendously difficult thing to get a handle on. And in fact, um, it's a topic of nonstop conversation, even evaluating morality itself, it seems. So... Whereas on one hand, I would certainly agree that most people sort of come up with their own sense of morality uh, based on their own feelings. What struck me about this conversation with Alex is that I don't think he, I don't know if he understands sort of the main mission behind what Jordan Peterson and others have been doing in terms of trying to get a sense of, well, we obviously have degrees of ethics and morality that we are trying to share. And in fact, not just trying to share, but trying to instill on the young and instill on our rivals and instill on our enemies one way or another. 
where do these things come from? And of course, um, Christians and uh, many people have said, well, they come from God. Well, that just opens up whole more kinds of questions about how do they come from God. Thundered from the top of a mountain in Exodus 20, for example, or spoken on a mountain on a sermon on a mount that, um, that, that uh, T. Grog thinks for that reason I'm a fundamentalist. But we have to dig into this a little bit more, a little bit more on his emotivism. Now, poor Bell was quite compliant because something that was easily predictable, in fact, happened in this video, which is that Justin Brierly continued um, in his long conversational uh, stretches, even though he kept checking in with Bell. I, you know, I'm taking over. Oh, no, no, I'm enjoying it. No, no, I'm enjoying it. And so, yeah, much of the conversation was a conversation between uh, Justin Brierly and Alex O'Connor. But let's listen to a little bit more. Christian atheist or something else, we're, we're using our, our, our intelligence, our reason, to justify the things we already, already believe deep down, basically. I think that's, uh, that's something that I've been trying to make noise about recently. Mm. I, I like when, if you ask what, what, what I guess is the, the, the hill that I'm dying on at the moment, it, it's about the emotive quality of human behaviors, how much we are motivated unknowingly mm. by essentially emotive forces and dressing it up in the language of reason. I just had Robert Sapolsky on the show, um, who is a philosopher, I think, at Stanford, and he's wrote, written a book about free will. And he told me about this, this great study that you might have come across where they were, they were trying to find out what was the biggest predictive factor uh, as to whether a judge, I think, would would grant bail or not hmm. uh, based on on some kind of crime they would have they would have given these judges and they're given the opportunity to to grant bail or to send them back to prison and they were trying to figure out what's the biggest predictive factor hmm. if you take a judge and you sort of take away like political bias and stuff what's the biggest predictive factor as to whether they'd send them back to prison or not and you know what they found it was how long it had been since the judge had last eaten a meal <laughs> wow <laughs> that was it Gosh. and people get sent to prison or not, based on how long on it's been. How hungry the judge feels since someone's eaten, and and people know this on a on a on a less serious level. Everyone is familiar with the sort of oh, sorry, I was a bit I was a bit hangry, or mm. uh, maybe I should sleep on it. Why do we sleep on it? Mm. What does that mean when you when you've got a decision to make? Sleep on it because you recognise that obviously, if you're in a sort of if you're tired, if you're hungry, if you're stressed, you're not in a position to think rationally. Mm. Well, I think that when you wake up in the morning, you're certainly in a position to think more rationally but you are still being dictated to uh, by your emotions in exactly the same way you were the night before, just perhaps to a, to a less extreme degree or to a less um, unusual mm. degree or, mm. or, or, or sort of yeah. this is more like what you would usually do, but it's still just emotions all the way down, if you ask me. Oh, just, just caught him right before the, uh, the little ad here. Yeah, yeah, and, and this, of course... It was Peugeot and Verveke recently where John Verveke basically made almost the same point that, yeah, not only is morality going out the door for emotions, but so is reason. Now, again, anybody who looks at human beings should very much understand this. And, well, people have all sorts of we call it motivated reasoning and i i agree again i agree again with alex that um this this great this great power of reasoning which is supposed to guide us into clarity so that we can get what we want and see the, the funny thing about that whole line is that i am going to use science and reason to achieve what i want so 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 what exactly is all of this stuff pointing to? No, no, no. It's towards the truth and good. But see, it, it just it just always seems to go in circles. And people have been making this point forever. And again, I'm not I'm not criticizing Alex for this. It's just that well, it doesn't really answer the question. And, and at some point, someone might ask, well, what, what exactly is the question? And, and the more you pursue it, the more you begin to realize that's not an easy thing to answer, even figuring out what the question is. Because when it comes right down to it, um, we want... And, and then suddenly you're just sort of 
there in religious territory. They want the kingdom of God or the kingdom of heaven or nirvana or utopia or, and as G.K. Chesterton pointed out, we, we almost always sort of stumble towards this using negatives. I want a place where, and even the Bible does this, you know, where, where tears are wiped and there's no, nobody dying young. And it's a tremendously difficult thing to talk about, to talk, to, to, to get, to get to down to details in terms of what will satisfy the human heart. Now, we all sort of chase this episodically to one point or another. So, well, uh, I, I my next meal, if I'm terribly hungry, that will satisfy me. And you experience some satisfaction at the next meal. Or this love will satisfy me. Or this job will satisfy me. Or this level of financial security will satisfy me. Or this level of compliance by my neighbors according to either of my moral, ethical, or emotive desires for how I'd like my neighbors to live, that will satisfy me and on and on and on, and we just can't get no satisfaction, which, of course, the Rolling Stones kind of ripped off from St. Augustine. Our hearts are restless, and in fact, one, if it would sort of pull a Petersonian move, by definition, God equals that which would be maximally satisfactory. There's a fun definition of God. So, but of course that sort of winds people up and no, 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 God's a flying spaghetti monster or a guy with a big arm with a big finger like pointing at Adam and saying, You're na who told you you were naked? So, you know, it's so funny because I don't know why I'm a little bit punchy, but some people like Punchy Paul and some people get a little... They just, they just snarky Paul is irritating. It's Paul should be less snarky. Paul should be nicer. Um, but anyway, so this was this was fascinating. Listen to this point, and again, at a to a certain degree, I have to say humans are guided by. Now we're back to the master and the emissary. They're guided by this right brain, and it tends to be or the master brain. It, and it tends to be that, and, and in another place in this conversation, O'Connor said it, what emotions are best conceived of, I had a book I read years ago by a guy named Roberts. I don't even, it's over on my shelf somewhere. I don't want to haul it out. Because you deal with emotions all the time in church because you're dealing with human beings. Emotions are signal. Emotions are telling you something. They're sort of like dreams in a sense and that they don't, tell you in the way that a lot of emissarians would love to be told but they're trying to tell you something and um depending on what you is and so listen to them and try and figure out what they're saying but they they really don't make great masters and you find someone whose emotions are their masters they don't make great masters uh they get people into trouble when they're angry they destroy things when they're sad they don't want to exist anymore on and on and on and on and on emotions are good emissaries emotions are good messengers they are not great masters but that just sort of pushes the question back in terms of well what really is morality and what really are ethics and of course even the conversations about morality and ethics finally have to give way to pointing towards ideals and this is part of you know where a lot of the conversations have been going in terms of the conversation with Peugeot, Verveke, and Hall, the conversation with, with Jordan and John Verveke recently, that, that ideals are finally fundamentally religious things. And if you define God as um, the, 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 the and you got to really watch that word thing, that which finally satisfies, I think it's a pretty good definition of God again. And, um, and everything sort of points in that direction, including morality is, I think morality is sort of like gravity in that we, we do all sorts of things to sort of resist it. I couldn't move my arms if I weren't resisting gravity. I couldn't walk upright if I weren't resisting gravity. But in the long run, the doggone thing just wins. But... One of the more interesting aspects of this video is that he dares, he dares to question the thesis of 
one of the people that we really look up to in this little corner. And Justin Brierley really looks up to him, and Bell Tyndall really looks up to him. Dares to question the thesis of dum 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 Dominion by Tom Holland. He does mention that he'd like to have a conversation with Tom Holland, which I would expect will happen at some point. But again, whether or not Tom Holland can actually convince Alex O'Connor of Tom Holland's thesis, especially if you're an emotivist, it doesn't make any difference. All the arguing, all the reason, all the explaining in the world, unless somehow, one way or another, Tom Holland manages to move the feelings of the great cosmic skeptic. Thing happens with our language when we when we're talking about philosophy. When we say something is is true or false, or when we're talking about um, when we talk in terms of syllogisms or all of this all of this kind of stuff, it's like it's necessarily not going to be able to capture what I think is the truly emotive foundation of all of our of all of our philosophizing because we just don't really have the language to to talk about it. I am um, obviously the work of Tom Holland, the work of. Glenn Scrivener, there's probably tons of others, would say that these intuitions are not, well, that they are, they're contingent upon Christianity. You hinted earlier that you don't believe that. You don't think that's quite the case. Mm. So this intuition that if you, you know, uh, to kill a child would be wrong. I think Tom Holland would say at least to a degree, that wasn't always the case, you know, in you know, ages gone by that, that wouldn't feel as wrong as it does now. There's a reason it feels wrong. It's not, it's not innate. It's something we've been taught. Mm -hmm. um, and we've been taught it by this odd little Jesus story. Yeah. Um, what do you say to that? I think it doesn't come from the story. I don't think it comes from the scripture. And, and again, this isn't really my area. That's why I'd love to speak to Tom Holland on the podcast, because I wouldn't want to yeah. debate him. I'd want to ask these, these, these questions. The biggest question I have is like, what, what are we talking about here when we say like, you know, Judeo-Christian culture, Judeo-Christian yeah. society? Because if you, if you removed those words mm -hmm. and just made the same argument, oh, your intuitions that you have ethically right now, they're really based upon, you can't say Christian society. What do you, what do you say? Like, maybe like the history of Europe in the past few hundred years, because you can't be talking about the scripture and you can't be talking about the Bible. You can't be talking about, uh, about that. Surely not. I mean, like, what are the kind of things that we talk about? We talk about like the... And, and then he'll go into... Uh questions about you know the the slaughter of canaanites it, it's so funny too when i was listening to that because it's like <clears throat> the bad thing about of course having no script and just doing this off the top of my head is that my brain interrupts me numerous times oh you could say this oh you could add this and i probably will it's not that god is only killing canaanites in the story I mean, this week I preached on, you know, the second half of the book of Exodus where Moses and the Levites slaughter 3,000 of Israel and then there's a plague that kills plenty more. And so, you know, at least at least God is, is not only wasting Canaanites and this somehow got connected with, this is somehow some sort of racism as if the mixed multitude that is included in Israel and someone's capacity to be included in Israel by virtue of the, of, um, of the practice of circumcision, they don't really care what color your skin is as long as you don't have that foreskin. That's sort of the way that system works. And of course, if someone is going to yell sexism, half the population, I think, was quite blessed that they didn't have to have that foreskin cut off in an age without anesthesia. A friend of mine on Twitter pointed out, Homath um, had a tweet about God, which was interesting. From God's perspective, everything will always be okay, but he loves all of his creation equally, even those of them that makes the others uh, ones not okay. It's just okay with God that this is how it is. So become one with God and you'll always be okay. Instructions pending. So whole math appears to be um, moving in a little bit more theological direction. Uh, Zero HP Lovecraft, who I also follow on Twitter, uh, came, I don't believe in God, but if I did, I would believe in a malicious one. And, you know, obviously my comments about, well, God didn't just kill Canaanites, he killed Israelites too, and not just male Israelites, but women and children too, um, of course leads a bunch of people to say, well, the God of the Bible is a moral monster of which I um, 
I do not agree. And then someone said, so so something similar to what the Gnostics believe in, or is it like JRPG where you fight angels, gods, and shit? Neither. I think the whole earth perpetually steeped in blood is nothing but a vast altar upon which all that is living must be sacrificed without end, without measure, without pause, until the consummation of things, until evil is extinct, until the death of death. And I think that looks like at the end is totally is a total void. Wow. I think I'd have a hard time walking around with that emotive posture in my life. But what struck me about this was, I, I really wonder how Jordan Peterson's project escapes people. Because everybody sees what he does, and everybody wants to sort of engage him on, well, does he believe in God? Does he not believe in God? Is he moving the needle with respect to religion? All of these things. But overall, his, his whole project is about where do our ethical feelings come from? That's what he's talking about constantly. And in that sense, when I first heard Tom Holland's Dominion thesis, I immediately said, he's doing the same thing as Jordan Peterson. So Tom Holland is basically saying all of these ethical emotions that we have have been formed and shaped by history all up until now. And Jordan Peterson goes quite a bit older and deeper. He wants to look at evolutionary biology. He wants to look at mythology. He wants to look at story. And, and the thing that I hear so often from many high and low of the... Alex O'Connor is no longer a new atheist, but we have somebody made a mention, yeah, the corner has grown, and so T. Grog has his place in the corner, and I think rightfully so. He's, he's more than welcome to continue to preach in my comment section. Even though, again, as I said in a little membership video, I think he sort of confuses. Um, when he looks at YouTube, he kind of thinks it as a television, but it's really much more of a telephone with this massive party line where we're all talking about these things. So... Not that he can't promote his views, that's fine. We we kind of, well, we do look forward to the day when he changes his mind, but um, will that day come? We'll never know. Or maybe we will know someday, but we'll see. The whole point of Peterson's quest is to ask. He recognizes that, hmm, the culture of the West seems to be about the best thing going around on this planet. To what can we attribute this culture where we have ideas about reciprocity and equality? To what can we attribute these moral feelings that we have? And Jordan Peterson's answer has been, boy, a lot of it comes out of that, that, that book. Now, if you were to, if you were to ask a question, what would also be true of a book that would have so profoundly shaped the moral imaginary of an entire society? You would imagine that would be the best-selling, most read, most studied, most worked over book in all of human history. And that book would indeed be the Bible. Nothing else is even close. Every time I try to research this, people say the second most popular book was Mao's Red Book, which apparently was the way that Mao tried to reshape their moral imaginary, and it didn't go well. Which is that why morality, again, is sort of like gravity. And, and we all sort of resist it and suspend it, and we do all sorts of things that, that keeps it, keeps it, that sort of, you know, not being completely moral because I'm standing upright here. I'm resisting the gravity. But H.P. Lovecraft's idea, zero H.P. Lovecraft's idea, basically imagines the void. So you're basically down to nihilism. So I think Alex is on his way. I think he's on his way. He, he has now discovered some fact about human beings, which I think 
um, is an improvement over the rather robot coding rationalist position he used to have. And now he's coming to the coming to a point of maturity where he recognizes, yeah, mo emotions really do drive us. And yeah, looking at the enormous diversity of human beings of every religion, one might very much have questions about uh, is there gravity in this moral universe? So completely understandable. But when you look at the conversations that Peterson and Holland have been pursuing, their questions are, what has shaped our moral imaginary? And again, I am, I am so often amazed. I should stop being amazed because it is so absolutely common. But so many, whether they be atheist or even Christian alike, sort of try to reduce the Bible to a list of rules. Now, there are many rules in the Bible, but I would argue that the story and the poetry are far more formational than the rules. And I, I had this in my estuary group when I, when I talked about, um, we were talking in our group about, you know, no man is above the law. And I said, can you name a Bible story where the, the person on top of the heap is called out because he has violated something? And David and Bathsheba, now you might say, well, see, there's a law. Thou shalt not commit adultery. Good. There's a law. It's, it's that law is one form of expression of this. And law is seldom the most influential expression of this. It can be clear, it can be clean, it can be obvious, but if you've listened to any of my Rough Drafts for Sunday or any of my sermons, I am a Calvinist minister. And while Calvinism, sort of taking a step back from Lutheranism, says mm, the law has its place. The law definitely has its place. But the law is not finally powerful enough to achieve what we finally need, which is a changed heart. Because the heart, this emotive, is what guides us. And then you have the question, well, how can the heart be changed? And then when you look at, I'd say, step way back and ask, what is Jordan Peterson looking for? And what is Tom Holland looking for? They are looking for that which will finally satisfy. They are looking for God. Because I think actually that which finally satisfies is one of the best definitions of God from a human perspective, emotive point of view that I can think of. Now, I know a lot of people want to think about a super thing in the sky, and there's certainly plenty of good theology and bad theology that one can debate and embrace or try to expel. But our emotions are formed. And they're formed by many, many different factors in us, by our appetites, by our culture, by our parents, by our friends, by the videos we watch, by the friends we have, by the religions, by the ideals. You can just look at ideals and then gaining and losing status. There's, there's, a, there's a very powerful way that our emotions govern. And again, it goes all the way back to Peterson and his lobsters and his um, serotonin and dopamine and all of those things. It's what we've been talking about the whole time. So I'm, I'm, I'm excited that Alex has gotten beyond sort of the rationality stage and has gotten into recognizing the human emotion stage, but you're going to have to ask questions about what forms these emotions. And then you have questions about, well, is there, are there actually better cultures and worse cultures? Are there actually human beings that are more moral and eth ethical and rightly celebrated as such, and those that are less, even though... There's a world of confusion and a world of debate, and that's always with us down here below. But to me, all of this points to, now someone might mention the word John Piper and his Christian hedonism. 
And maybe what I'm saying isn't far from that. But I think actually there are many definitions of God because God is just that hard to avoid. But from this perspective, one of the best ones is God is that which finally satisfies perfectly, eternally, never-endingly. I think that's a definition. So, um, that's my video. Leave a comment. Straighten me out. I, I look forward to being straightened.